Welcome again, everyone. My name is Allison Bodine. I'm the moderator for tonight's Venezuela Solidarity Network monthly picket and webinar, where we are going to once again continue this urgent and important discussion about the results of Venezuela's presidential election that was, took place on July 28th of this year. I'm actually joining today after being international observer on another electoral process here in Venezuela, a voting process, which was a popular vote uh, where commune, communes and communal councils across Venezuela were voting on which projects should be funded in the coming period. And I uh, look forward to sharing my insights about that all with you. And I'm very happy to be joining uh, from Venezuela tonight, along with one of our other speakers. So again, my name is Alison Bodine. I'm the coordinator of Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and author of the book, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. On Thursday, August 22nd, the Venezuelan Supreme Court of Justice released its ruling ratifying the results of the 2024 presidential election in favor of the re-election of President Maduro. Already, as we've seen over the days since the 22nd, this decision is being questioned in international mainstream media, the New York Times, CNN, and others, and at the same time, of course, by the U.S. State Department. They continue to propagate the myth that the U.S. government is the final arbiter of democracy in Venezuela. So we're here for a discussion with firsthand accounts from the recent Venezuelan presidential election, where we'll hear from people who are observers and participants in the election, and they'll share their insights on the electoral process, the role of international observers, and the broader implications uh, for US-Venezuela relations and Venezuela moving forward as they continue to fight against misinformation, disinformation, and all sorts of attacks stemming from the United States government. The Venezuela Solidarity Network, which has organized tonight's webinar and online picket, is carrying forward the monthly pickets that were organized by Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, and Just Peace Advocates for over three years. Now these actions will continue under the Venezuela Solidarity Network, which is a new network of individuals and organizations coming together to stand against U.S.-led intervention in Venezuela and in favor of Venezuela's sovereignty, independence, and self-determination. Organizations that are part of the Venezuela Solidarity Network include the Alberto Lovera Bolivarian Circle in New York City, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, the Alliance for Global Justice, Chicago Alba Solidarity, Code Pink, Fire This Time, Friends of the Congo, the International Action Center, Just Peace Advocates, the Louis Riel Bolivarian Circle of Toronto, the Orinoco Tribune, Popular Resistance, the Sanctions Kill Campaign, Task Force on the Americas, Venezuela Analysis, and Workers World Party. We encourage you to add to this list and join in. I will put a link in the chat for how you can join the Venezuela Solidarity Network. And once again, thank you uh, for joining us here today. I'll just go through the program for a second. We have uh, reports coming from four international observers, in including Justine Taba, Camilla Escalante, William Kamakaro, and Roger Harris. Then we will have time for Q&A before we hear any concluding thoughts from our participants and speakers, and then we take a group photo. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome someone who I met just one month ago when I was here, also as an international observer at the presidential election. Justine Taba is from the indigenous Pueblo nations of Acoma Pueblo, Santa Clara Pueblo, and Tezuque Pueblo in the United States. She is a member of the Indigenous Liberation Organization, the Red Nation, and Marketing Director with 
red media. Thank you very much, Justine, for joining us here today. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, excuse me, there are some attendees who are saying that uh, they are not uh, hearing anything. Some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, I don't know. Yeah, okay, let's, let's continue. I don't know. I, I wouldn't know what the problem is. Yeah, I just suggest if anyone's having trouble hearing, I guess they wouldn't maybe be able to hear me, but we could put in the chat that they should check their settings on their interpretation. Perhaps they're not in the right place. So we'll add that to the chat. Justine, go ahead. Thank you. Ubi aki indi ko etsi hopa na bi tela ka ka povi te tuge winge ka po winge hera aku iwariomu. Good afternoon and good evening, comrades and relatives. I am calling in from the pueblo of Akama tonight. The Red Nation was invited to participate in this year's Venezuelan presidential elections as international election observers. From July 22nd through the 29th, comrade Mayra Olivia Rios, who is actually providing Spanish interpretation right now, and I had the grand honor of delegating to Caracas, Venezuela. Today, I will be presenting on behalf of the Red Nation, a presentation pre prepared by Mayra and I. I don't have a lot of time, so I thought it would be a good idea to get right into things by showing you all a video that Mayra and I created while in Venezuela. This was created on election day and right after we had returned to our hotel from observing the elections. We, pre we prepared the video for TikTok, but we have it on all of our platforms, including Instagram and YouTube, and the video is pinned to the top of our page on the Red Nation podcast TikTok page. I'm going to share my screen and show y'all what I'm talking about. Okay, hand right here at the top. I apologize, it's loading. Today is election day in Venezuela. Have you been hearing Western media panic about the Venezuelan elections? Mainstream Western media claims that the Venezuelan elections are fraudulent, that Nicolas Maduro is a violent authoritarian, and that the right-wing opposition in Mundo Gonzalez is leading in the polls. The Red Nation has been invited to Caracas, Venezuela to witness the elections as international observers. First and foremost, the Venezuelan elections are completely legitimate. Today, we visited the polling stations in Caracas, while other international delegates made their way to other parts of the country. Contrary to mainstream Western media, voting registration is guaranteed in Venezuela, and Venezuelans abroad can vote under timely registration. Voters arrived to their designated polling stations, which is one of 15,797 voting centers. There are 269,000 streets with democratically elected leaders who organize the masses to make their way to exercise their right to vote. We visited polling stations set up at two elementary schools, one elder home, one public library, and one apartment building. The first thing voters do is confirm their identification number with an official listing outside of the polling station. The voter makes their way to their designated voting table in each voting center. Today we saw voting centers that had between one and five electoral tables. Next they show their identification card to electoral table members and electoral table members are chosen at random from all registered voters. After their identity is confirmed, they confirm again with their fingerprint. 
They cast their vote secretly and electronically and are printed a paper ballot that they cast in a ballot box to confirm their choices. Lastly, they confirm that they have voted with their signatures and their fingerprint by ink. The electoral system is audited up to 16 times before and after voting, including the voters deciding to conduct their own audit. The electoral system for Venezuelan elections could be considered the most reliable in the world. The bottom line is, there is no room for fraud in the Venezuelan elections. Nicolas Maduro has been president of Venezuela since 2013 under the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. Voting in Venezuela is more than picking between two candidates. Maduro has been democratically elected by the masses in Venezuela because it is the people's will to protect the Bolivarian Revolution. Edmundo Gonzalez represents U.S.-funded opposition and colonial oligarchy. Let's remember, Venezuela possesses the world's largest oil reserves and refuses to live under the boot of imperialism. Despite living under 930 sanctions by the U.S., Venezuela has created their own internal exchange system and will not bow to the U.S.-centered International Monetary Fund. Maduro's expected win will set Venezuela's path of economic sovereignty and stability for the next 50 years by establishing his government plan called La Siete T, or 7T, or 7 Transformations. Do not believe what Western mainstream media has to say about Venezuela. Venezuela shows us what a people's government looks like, what a people power electoral system looks like, and that socialism can not only win, but can be protected by its own people. Venezuela gives the world hope in an unequivocally real and material way. Let this information demystify the Venezuelan elections for you. Again, the bottom line is the Venezuelan presidential elections are completely legitimate. During the week leading up to the elections, we as international observers participated as speakers and audience to the second edition of the World Social Alternative organized by ALBA TCP or the Bolivarian Alliance Commercial Treaty for the Peoples of the Americas and the Simon Bolivar Institute in Caracas. It was two days worth of panels and the Red Nation also had the honor of participating in the panel Alternative, Pe Alternative for People's Rights and Reparations and you can find that on our YouTube channel as well. One of our most profound realizations in Venezuela is the importance of media literacy and the dangers of media illiteracy. In hindsight, it was quite profound that the World Social Alternative opened with the panel Communication and Resistance because that alone laid out the whole context for why we were there at all. We were forewarned of the media hybrid warfare to be had by the global North and ruling class, but mainly the United States against Venezuela before, during, and after the elections. As said in our debriefs published on our podcast, the neoliberal corporate media uses media, whether it be mainstream media or social media, as the indoctrination tool into capitalist culture and interests. Come July 28th, Venezuelan elections were held in relative peace with only a couple of disturbances reported. At 11 p.m. via national TV, Elvis Amoroso from, from the National Electoral Council announced that the system that transmits the result had suffered a hacking attack or a terrorist attack, as the chair of the council called it. This was the reason given behind the delay in sharing of the results, which were expected to be given at 10 p.m., so shortly after midnight that night, Mayra and I had finally shared the news with our organization that Nicolas Maduro had won the presidential election. The following percentage, percentages were shared publicly. Nicolas Maduro and the United Socialist Party of Venezuela had obtained 51.2% of the vote with 5,150,092 votes. Right-wing U.S.-backed candidate Edmundo Gonzalez was at 44.2% of the vote with 4,445,978 votes, and all the other candidates totaled at 4.6% of the vote with 462,704 votes. Meaning, even if all the opposition were united under one candidate, under one vote, opposition to the United Socialist Party of Venezuela and Nicolas Maduro would have still failed to win. Socialism is simply the people's will in Venezuela. 
And that is the truth that imperialism refuses to accept. In the days and weeks following, we saw violence in Caracas that was declared a coup attempt by opposition supporters. We saw the ruling class figure, Elon Musk, fully involve, involving himself in any coup attempt to be had by suggesting putting Nicolas Maduro in Guantanamo Bay by tweeting, I am coming for you, Maduro. And probably the most unsettling example is when the U.S. State Department released a statement announcing the far-right opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez as the winner of the election, a complete opposition and disrespect to Venezuela's democratic institutions and their official election results. This intervention proved once more that the U.S. government's intention to destabilize and end the socialist revolution that has been democratically placed in office by the citizens of Venezuela. By August 22nd, the Supreme Court of Justice certified the results announced by the National Electoral Council regarding the July 28th elections in which the President of the Republic, Nicolas Maduro, was elected for the constitutional period of 2025 through 2031. There's so much more I wish I could share with you all, but I am just about out of time. Please check out the Red Nation podcast to watch our debriefs of our time in Venezuela and to listen to the episode titled Venezuela Mixtape that has clips of all of our episodes of Venezuela since 2020 and provides our indigenous socialist perspectives of Venezuela. As comrade Nick Estes said in our news chat, the empire is really trying to suffocate and kill the Bolivarian revolution. Watching the pro-Palestine crowd fall for the pro-coup narratives of the electoral fraud demonstrates the lack of political consciousness around imperialism and its connection to our own movements, unquote. Venezuela is laying the groundwork for the entire world. They are shining. They are a shining example of resilience and success of socialism. My profound realization of our experiences in Venezuela is that the people of Venezuela are protecting the Bolivarian revolution in a seriously democratic and justified way. Venezuela is living our hopes and dreams in a real and material way, and we owe them the truth sharing that is happening right now. Kutawaha, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Justine Teba. It, uh, you are an example of keeping good time and we really appreciate that and also the depth of information and how much you were able to share in that short time I think is really important. Uh, really appreciate your participation today and look forward to the question and answer period as well. So up next uh, I do want to see if William is uh, here. William is also here in Venezuela uh, so while he's here with us I thought Maybe we'd see if, if you wanted to go next, William, if you're able to. Uh, William, are you in a position to join us now? Okay. Not hearing William, so we will go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Camilla Escalante. Camilla is the editor of Kausichan News, a media outlet uh, that hopefully everyone here follows. It gets a lot of good English language coverage of Latin American news. Uh, Camilla is also a Latin American correspondent for Press TV, and she has reported from Bolivia, Ecuador, Cuba, Venezuela, and many other places. Uh, Camilla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm going to start with... Um... I was also in Venezuela during the elections, but I went, of course, as a reporter in order to uh, cover everything that was going on. I reported for Press TV and also on social media um, for Casacha News, my outlet. And so while I was in Venezuela, I had the opportunity to interview a number of people, many of which um, you would have seen my interviews um, on my personal social media, on Kasacha News and on Press TV. And we heard uh, from people um, on why they thought this election was so important, why they were going out to cast their ballot, and why it was so um, important to uh, re-elect President Nicolas Maduro. And some of the things they told us is that, um, of course, they want to continue the Bolivarian Revolution and all of its projects. They wanted to see uh, the advances, uh, which began under Commander Hugo Chavez 25 years ago, continue. And they see the economy as having improved uh, 
in, in, a, in a very large way in a short amount of time. This is a country in which it was very difficult to acquire some very basic necessities in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And um, there was, of course, hyperinflation. And it was um, a very difficult situation if someone were to leave the country um, on um, on visit or uh, for a short while, they would make sure to, to bring back some of the basic necessities they needed into the country because they had gone missing off of shelves. And I'm sure everyone saw that because it was uh, greatly exaggerated in the media. All those sorts of things have changed now. And I was based in Venezuela during those very difficult years. And having been back there in recent years, including on this trip, um, on this visit, you can see that people are very active in the streets, that there's a lot of commerce, that there's uh, a lot of stores open. It's actually a very populated city, a very densely populated city in some areas. And people are living really normal lives compared to other countries of Latin America. And that's not shown in the media. So people have said that they uh, have some restored hope and um in the possibilities that are available to them because uh, economically things have dramatically improved. It's easier to uh, to pay for things using different forms of payment. And there are a lot more products on shelves. And of course, as a result of that, a lot of Venezuelans who had left the country have returned in recent years. People told me that they don't want to see their state industries and state companies privatized once the right wing uh, were to get into power. They said, um, that they, they remembered the actions of the opposition during recent years and the way in which the opposition leaders, uh, people like uh, Maria Corina Machado and all of the other uh, far-right opposition leaders in the country, went to the United States and they went to the EU and the exterior and they demanded and basically begged for unilateral coercive measures to be imposed on their own people, to be imposed on their own country. Uh, they were also demanding other types of, of intervention, such as military intervention in Venezuela in order to overthrow the government and military aggression, um, which we, we did see some threats being made in recent years. And those uh, leaders of the opposition also were part of um, and aided the large scale theft of Venezuelan assets in uh, billions I believe hundreds of billions of dollars um, in um, in all sorts of different ways in terms of the theft of gold, um, the assets of Sitgo and other things that were stolen and um, and different forms of illegal activity that we saw and corruption on the part of the opposition. And people remember that. And people are also aware of what will happen to their country if they were to deliver power to the right wing. And they're seeing what's going on in other countries, such as uh, Argentina and Ecuador, countries that now have uh, right wing leaders. And what has happened is that those countries uh, and the people of those countries no longer have control over their natural resources. They no longer are able to benefit through social programs or anything else um, for uh, if they are to exploit their natural resources. In fact, those countries are open for sale and people are coming from abroad, large corporations and foreign countries like the United States to exploit those countries, take their resources, and will those people will never see the benefits of that um, in, in, in Argentina or Ecuador or anywhere else that's happening. It's also happening in neighboring Guyana and Suriname, sadly. Um, I also wanted to... Um, talk about some some of the reaction to the um to, to the news that president nicolas maduro was reelected, and i know that there's a lot of uh fixation i guess on the negative response and what all the media has been saying but i think it's really important to say that just like uh the others who are speaking on on today's meeting that in fact there were people from five continents uh, who were in Venezuela during the elections as observers or accompanying the elections, um, and also that there were other reporters such as, my, as myself who were there during this process to witness the elections and report on them. Um, and so um, in, in the days that followed uh, the elections, 
we saw a lot of joy and a lot of really great supportive messages from all around the world. Um, one of them is from Latin America itself, Alba Movimientos, which is a collection of social movements, largely from South America, congratulated uh, Nicolas Maduro and has said that this is that Venezuela is um, a model for other countries to aspire to. And that is a country that is a leader for all peoples and uh, movements and parties of Latin America. We saw accompaniment of the elections from Caribbean uh, leaders and Caribbean observers who have also put out a statement saying that they um, reject all of the interventionist um, attempts and all of the aggression from the exterior and that, that what they witnessed was a very clean and transparent process and that uh, ultimately it's up to Venezuelan state institutions and the Venezuelan people to determine what will happen next. We also saw congratulatory messages from China, Russia, from Iran, from Elba TCP, and uh, who, who said that, uh, you know, they're both um, happy to observe that everything, at least on election day itself, proceeded peacefully, and that Venezuelans were able to, uh, to fulfill their civic duty in voting, and that, uh, and that they will respect the will of the Venezuelan people. And I would say across the global South, it has in large part been uh, the attitude of most governments that they support this internal process and for Venezuelans, and that Venezuelans will have to be the ultimate arbiters of, of what happens. Um, and, uh, and, and most people and most governments around the world are not, not supportive of this small group of countries once again, that has said that they uh, don't recognize uh, the results that were announced by the National Electoral Council. Uh, those countries are really a minority in the world. And I think it doesn't seem like that in North America. It doesn't seem like that in the global North or even in certain countries of Latin America sometimes. But it really is a, a minority of countries who believe that they themselves should decide who is going to govern Venezuela, which is not their country and not um, and none of their business. Uh, but it is it is worth saying that uh, since um, since the 31st of July, the OAS Permanent Council has convened three meetings uh, on Venezuela, and one of them is set to be tomorrow. And Venezuela left the Organization of American States uh, in 2019 officially, having announced their intention to exit the bloc in 2017 because the OAS had previously uh, intervened in the internal matters of Venezuela. And so this is a bloc that is once again trying to gather countries that are closely aligned with the United States and Canada in order to turn them against Venezuela and convince them that they should have some say in what's going on in, inside this sovereign country. It's completely illegitimate and also in the OAS, it's important to say that they have these observer states who are speaking and giving speeches in the middle of the session that aren't even countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, they're countries of Europe. They have observers from uh, observer states, which are Italy, Spain, the UK, uh, Holy See, and um, and one other country. And you know, again, they are trying to deliberate and pass resolutions on a country that is not even under in any sense the jurisdiction of the OAS. And of course, they're also trying to form a new Lima group through having meetings um, in other countries, the way in which they did starting in 2018. These countries, of course, are saying that they recognize uh, Edmundo Gonzalez as the person who received more votes in, in the election. And of course, again, this has nothing to do with these countries, and they simply are a small group of countries who are just closely aligned with the United States. Um, and um, of course, for, for those who are in the United States, there is once again an attempt to pass a new sanctions bill, a bipartisan bill in the legislature that is largely being uh, promoted and headed by Senator Rick Scott of Florida, who is basically on Twitter and everywhere else threatening Venezuela and its government, um, trying to uh, bring back some of the unilateral you know, course of measures that had been slightly eased uh, last year and trying to mount more pressure on the friends of Venezuela and the different countries and companies around the world who might try 
to do business with Venezuela. And in the end, what of course that does is make it more difficult for Venezuela to purchase necessary items for its people. Uh, luckily, Venezuela is a country that has now become almost completely food sovereign because in these past years of difficulties, they invested a lot of time and resources in their own agriculture and national production in order to circumvent the sanctions. And of course, there are a lot of friends of, of Venezuela, such as Iran, China, and uh, Russia and Turkey that were very crucial during those years that helped as well, and who don't recognize uh, those illegal sanctions. Um, and I, I guess I'll just finish because I want to keep on time for Allison, but um, I think you know, one of the main reasons why we're seeing all of this, all of these attempts to destabilize the country and overturn uh, the election result and install a new government is always going to be because of oil. A lot of studies have been done. We know that Venezuela has the greatest, largest oil reserves in the world, but you can actually find a lot of studies online that actually details the way in which uh, Venezuela's oil is, uh, is is so well suited for the United States. Um, that the United States would be able to to benefit from it, and it's it's uh, you know it, it's detailed there very well. This is something that they have their eyes on. They want to go in there with their companies and extract all of those resources at a time when the United States is is losing influence all over the world and in parts of other parts of Latin America as well. This is a really crucial source of um, of energy for the United States and its allies as they continue to. Uh, fuel wars around the world. And so ultimately, that's what is, um, that is one of the, the main reasons that they are behind this uh, ongoing coup attempt, and why they're not going to be uh, stepping back anytime soon. And so I think we're going to see a lot of uh, mounting pressure in the coming months, because as the chronogram goes, uh, Nicolas Maduro, the president will be re- um, will be inaugurated in January, and there will be another attempt by the right wing to install their candidate or former candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, who will inevitably probably swear himself in in the middle of the street the way in which Juan Guaido did in the beginning of 2019. And of course, with everything that's going on in the United States and the election, we have both the Democrats and the Republicans using this issue and politicizing our countries and and, uh, you know, getting involved in our countries in order to try to gain votes from people such as those in Florida. Thank you so much um, for uh, inviting me and I'll throw it back to you, Allison. Thanks, Camilla. It was great uh, working with you a bit here in Venezuela and seeing your reporting on the ground. We'll say that uh, there were about 1300 journalists, at least in Venezuela at the time, all working hard like Camilla to tell the story of people in Venezuela, because the narrative that we're told in North America and in Europe is really the voice of the US State Department echoed through puppets in Venezuela or through their right wing supporters in Venezuela. And very rarely, literally the hundreds of thousands of people that as elections observers during the presidential election, we observed mobilizing on the streets in support of the government of President Nicolas Maduro. So thank you for all of your work and for that perspective. I'm sure people will have lots of questions uh, during the q and I'll check in again with William to see. William, are you uh, able to join us to speak now? Or are you? OK. Not hearing from William. We will proceed to our next speaker, uh, Roger Harris. Roger is joining us as a uh, sorry. Roger is joining us as an executive committee member of the U.S. Peace Council. He is active with Task Force on the Americas, the Sanctions Kill campaign, and is a founding member of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Roger has also been very active in uh, re writing articles and publishing articles uh, related to the presidential election in Venezuela and especially at the lies of mainstream media. So Roger, thank you for all your work leading up to today's webinar and all you'll do in the future, but we're looking forward to your words today. The floor is yours. Thank you. And I wanted to address the media coverage of this and how they sort of shift the narrative away from US interference 
and into the weeds of the uh, um, electoral process. It's kind of like looking at a, a, a crime scene, a murder scene, where people become obsessed because the murder victim had unpaid parking tickets, but they forget about who, who the murderer is. It came as no surprise that the U.S.-backed opposition called the 2024 Venezuelan presidential election fraudulent when they lost. They had announced that intention before the election. Cries of fraud have been the far right's practice in nearly every one of the 31 national contests since the Bolivarian Revolution began a quarter of a century ago, except for the two contests that were lost by the Chavistas, the movement founded by Hugo Chavez and carried on by Nicolas Maduro. That's because the far right opposition which is funded and largely directed by the Venezuelan government, um, pursues an insurrectionary strategy. It's not a democratic strategy. Neither they nor the United States recognize the legitimacy of the Venezuelan government. And that's been since Maduro was first elected in 2013. The entry of the U.S.-backed opposition into the electoral arena was not based on democratic participation that recognized the constitution or the institutions of the Venezuelan state. For instance, we talked, we, you've probably read in the press about the US backed opposition's primary. And I put that in, in air quotes because it was not conducted by the official Venezuelan electoral authority, the CNE, as it had in previous years. Rather, it was a private affair administered by an NGO, Sumate a recipient of U.S. National Endowment for Democracy Funds, the NED, which is well known as a CIA cutout. Washington's pre-chosen candidate was Maria Correa Machado, and she won in a crowded field of 13 candidates with an incredulous 92% um, vote. When some of the other candidates in the primary called fraud Machado had the ballots destroyed. And she could do that because Sumate, the NGO, was her personal organization. In fact, Machado is despised by much of the other opposition. She's a faux populist. She's a member of one of the richest families in Venezuela. She went to Yale and lived in Florida. While the populists suffered under US unilateral coercive measures, she championed them and even called for military intervention. Washington backed, uh, and I, I should also add that internationally, Machado has very strong ties with the international right. Notably, Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, also some of the other writers like, the, uh, like um, Mele in uh, Argentina. The Washington backed Machado knowing full well that in 2015, she was barred from running for office. Back then, she was a member of the National Assembly and she accepted a diplomatic post with a foreign country in order to, to testify against her own country. Such treason is constitutionally prohibited in Venezuela as it is in many other countries. For the US, Machado's disbarment was a bonus. The State Department could claim that its candidate was unfairly disqualified when that was the given to begin with. Washington's intent, and this is really the take home message, was not to encourage a fee, uh, free and fair democratic process. On the contrary, it was to de delegitimize the process that was already in place that our other speakers have spoken about. Disbarred, Machado then personally chose, personally chose a surrogate, not democratically, the man named Edmundo Gonzalez. The former diplomat from the 1980s was completely unknown. He had no electoral experience. And contrary to the nonsense that we see in the corporate press, there wasn't any unified opposition. The non-Chavista elements have been anything but unified. Had they been, they may have had made the most of the fact that 48% of, of the electorate did not actually vote for Maduro, according to the count of the CNE. The assertion by the Machado Gonzalez 
that, and I sort of lumped them because Gonzales really is a surrogate. Um, their um, assertion that they won the election by a margin of 70% completely lacks any credibility. That mean, that would mean that seven out of 10 Venezuelans supported them. And that hasn't been proven in, in the streets. Um, in fact, Machado called her followers out on the 3rd of August and again on the 17th. But the turnout was smaller than even her pre-election rallies. Meanwhile, pro-Maduro rallies dwarfed the oppositions. And that was an indication of a high level of organization and popular support that we saw that the Bolivarian Revolution has when we were election observers earlier this month. The, um, and in July, rather. Uh, the Machado Gonzalez platform is not a popular one. They called for extreme, extreme neoliberal privatization of education, healthcare, housing, food assistance, the national oil industry. In backing someone so unattractive, so unknown, and so unpopular as Gonzalez, the United States showed its disinterest in a good faith engagement in the democratic electoral process. Truly free and fair elections in Venezuela were impossible. And, that, and that's not because of the supposed conspiracies of the ruling Chavistas, but because of the conditions imposed by Washington by their hybrid war against Venezuela. The narrative on Venezuela has shifted, has been shifted by Washington and echoed in the corporate press. The paramount interference of the U.S. course of measures is ignored while attention is shifted to the intricacies of Venezuelan electoral law. The larger picture gets lost in the statistical weeds. This shifted narrative is designed to place the burden of proof on the sovereign government to prove its legitimacy. But five days ago, the Supreme Court of Venezuela, as we know, affirmed the CNA's count, confirming Maduro's victory. And the Hinterlaces poll found that 60% of Venezuelans trust the CNA results. So in conclusion, I would say, Venezuela has the right to defend its national sovereignty in the face of continued US imperial aggression. Thank you very much. Thank you. All of our speakers are catching me off guard because they're all very much on time, it's wonderful. That way we can have a good discussion uh, following. So uh, that I think concludes our speakers. I know William is, I believe, still trying to stay connected or get connected. So of course, when William Kamakaro, uh, the national co-coordinator of the Alliance for Global Justice is able to join us, uh, we will give him the floor. But I um, think for now, we will uh, go on to a few announcements. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to mention that we will have a q and A. I see there's already a, a few questions in the question and answer box. Do encourage people to use the question and answer box, uh, and that way we can find them easily rather than looking through the chat. Uh, so if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please do put them in the question and answer box. The Venezuela Solidarity Network, which I mentioned, has formed recently. We actually launched in December of 2023 publicly and have continued our organizing work since then, doing uh, these monthly webinars and online pickets, but also monthly meetings where we talk and exchange with one another ideas for coordinating our work and news about what's happening in Venezuela, or we continue uh, to plan for our response in this recent period to the U.S. continued strengthening intervention in Venezuela. And really, uh, what was, and we witnessed as international elections observers, perhaps that could be a first question, was an attempted coup in which uh, the right wing, the ultra right wing here in Venezuela, uh, paid people to foment violence. So in order to combat this, there are many ways, one of which involves our coordinated action through the Venezuela Solidarity Network. A few other ways include a Venezuela elections toolkit, which I will put in the chat, 
which is essentially a collection of articles and videos that have been categorized in a way that hopefully it'll be a useful tool for anyone that's dealing with answering questions uh, from people about Venezuela or looking for an article on a particular subject. I really think that uh, this toolkit, uh, which has been put together by some members of the Venezuela Solidarity Network is gonna be a useful tool, not only for today, but in our continuing work. Also, uh, there is an It's still being discussed, but I just encourage people to watch your inbox for the invite and uh, as well, we'll post in the chat again about joining the Venezuela Solidarity Network, either the email list or looking at affiliating as an organization. So those are uh, the announcements that I wanted to make uh, today. We will go ahead and go into our question and answer period, the question and answers um, is a time for us to hear from all of the speakers on their different perspectives. And uh, one thing I thought would be a, an interesting place to start would be really about the direct uh, lies that we're hearing in media or the direct message that we're hearing, which is that there's no evidence, quote, that the uh, President Maduro won the reelection. No evidence. They, they just say that blatantly in the media. So what is, uh, to the panelists, what is your response to the New York Times? Who would like to go first? Perhaps uh, if Camilla, if you wouldn't mind going first. Sure. Sorry, I'm now in the dark because I'm um, on my front patio and it, it got dark. Um, so I think what um, Michael is referring to is that on August 26th, so two days ago, um, one of the CNE rectors, or yesterday, uh, one of the CNE rectors who had gone missing, uh, he published a statement and it seems as if he left the country and he is now rumored to be in Colombia or Panama, it seems, we don't know for sure. Uh, but he has been missing since the election. And so this person was nowhere to be found. Um, and he obviously didn't fulfill his duties because he left the country. And so he has a whole two page statement that he posted online. And based on that, he um, what Michael said is, 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 is that now all these other outlets are saying that there's no proof that Maduro won. Well, it had been rumored that before he reappeared yesterday that he was going to perhaps show up with all of um, this information of this, that, and the other, proving whatever. But he actually didn't say very much of anything. He he basically said that he himself can't prove anything. And so it seems that he is um, he's outside of fulfillment of his duties. And I'm not sure what has happened so far in the last... 24 hours, but I'm positive that if he hasn't already been summoned, he will be by the electoral chamber of the Supreme uh, Court of Justice of Venezuela for uh, failing to fulfill his duties and for disappearing. And so I think there will probably be a legal proceeding against him. Um, but apart from that, it's kind of like the only thing we have is this two page um, statement. So I, I, um, I really think that things like that are done in coordination with the media and in coordination with, uh, for example, the State Department so that they can base those sorts of statements um, and, and use that as, as, as the basis for their interventionist statements that are to come. Of course, casting doubt on, on the electoral process as we've seen before, but um, perhaps one of the other um, observers would like to, to, to respond as well. Yeah. Uh, Roger, do you have any response? Well, I, I, I would add that the proof is not on the streets. And, th and think back to 2002. There was a U.S.-backed coup um, and it, it, in April 2002, and it disposed the democratically elected president, Hugo Chavez. That coup only lasted 20, uh, 47 hours because the people uprose 
surrounded the presidential palace and returned uh, Chavez back to his rightful place. If the opposition really had the support that they claim, one seven out of ten people, they could they could command the streets. In two thousand and two, the people defied the military, and brought back their democratically elected president. Um, the the claims of fraud are ones that we always heard and we will always hear because they don't recognize the legitimacy of the Venezuelan government and the Venezuelan people. And I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, Justine, do you have any uh, response you'd like to jump in with now? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have uh, much to say about, about it, but what I can say is that there's a reason that we were, uh, again, taught about uh, media literacy during our time there. That was like the first and foremost point. And we, you know, this is Venezuela up against neoliberal corporate media ran by the United States. The New York Times, it might as well be called the New York Crimes. Um, we've seen how they reported on Palestine. We've seen them report about mass rapes by Hamas, which has been a blatant lie. And this is imperialist media. And this imperialist media is taken seriously. And it is also um, like hailed as a, a le legitimate news source when it has um, interest in imperialism and pushing forward the boat of imperialism. So I, uh, I, you can't trust this kind of media. You can't trust a news outlet that peddles lies. Yeah, very good point. So uh, the next question we had is if any of uh, the elections observers had the chance to talk to anyone that said they were not going to vote for Maduro and if they gave any reason why they were not going to vote for Maduro. Did anyone have that experience? If you did, feel free to jump in. Anyone? Yeah, uh, I, I, I spoke to a few people that, that said so. Um, and the, the, the reason, uh, not, not going to like the specific reason, but basically the reason was because of the US unilateral coercive measures. These were people who felt like they were wanted a change that they were fatigued by you know, blackouts, by long lines, by shortages, by brain drain that are caused by people being forced to leave the country for ec economic reasons. Um, and the, 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 they were quite explicit. The, 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 this was before the election, was actually talking to people in on the election line. Um, I, I think what we should understand is the nature of the U.S. unilateral course of measures, which are euphemistically called sanctions. Um, they, they're designed to punish, but they're designed more than just to punish. What they're designed to is to prevent recovery. Um, of course, it, think back to 2013, when Maduro was first elected. He was elected after uh, Hugo Chavez died. And during that period, there was a certain amount of deferred maintenance. Some issues like the currency exchange rate was sort of um, was a, a pending issue that didn't, didn't really get, get addressed. So Maduro it, um, inherited a very big problems. And the second he got elected, there were the Marimbas, the, the um, violent demonstrations against him. He has to had his feet to the fire ever since he got elected um, in 2014-15. The international um, oil prices uh, bottomed out, and that that was a big blow to the the economy. And there was also a certain amount of what we should admit corruption and mismanagement, um, which is not new to either Venezuela um, and it existed before the Chavez years as well. And finally, got he got hit by the COVID. All these things hit the Venezuelan economy. The Venezuelan common economy went into nosedive. Huge um, inflation and stuff like that. Remarkably, Venezuela, under the leadership of Maduro, has turned around the economy. Now the, um, the, um, the projected growth rate 
by the IMF, not, not a friendly organization to the Venezuelans, projects a 4% um, GDP growth next year, this year, which is twice the GDP growth, by the way, of the United States with the, for their, their projection. So there was a turnaround of the economy. And so what we see is that the, the, the purpose of the unilateral coercive measures was not simply to punish the Venezuelans, but to prevent them from recovering. But it really shows the strength of the Maduro government and their economic policies and the working with the populace to turn that around. And I think, I think it's, it's really remarkable. I think that it will really go down in history as a very remarkable tur turnaround. Thank you, Roger. Camilla, I'm, if I recall correctly, I believe you attended uh, even one of the opposition pre-rallies or went into the, kind of the we'll say, pro-opposition or people that were likely going to vote for Edmundo Gonzalez neighborhoods. Would you like to share any reflections on that as a response to this question? Yeah, I completely um, agree with, with Roger's assessment. I think that's completely spot on. There are a lot of people who um, obviously are very unhappy with their salaries, with the wages in the country, because they are so low, as are the wages in all of uh, most of the rest of Latin America. This is a characteristic of a part of the world that has been historically exploited, has been uh, in intentionally uh, uh, not able to develop at the same rate as the global north um, because of our history of colonialism and enslavement and everything else that's take place. Now in Venezuela, as uh, Roger said, this is a country which has in recent years been subject to economic sabotage, to economic attacks and to interference. It's not able to advance any of the projects of its economy or organize its economy uh, and conduct business in a a way that a normal country would be able to. So this affects everything in the country and this affects people's salaries. And for that reason, in Venezuela or in any other part of the world, people seek economic opportunities elsewhere and they decide to leave. And that's a big reason why people said that they wanted to leave or that they wanted their family members to return and that they believe if there was a change in model that in fact people would perhaps, uh, maybe their family members would return. But th those are pretty much the basic reasons what, that people were telling me. What they weren't telling me was nobody said anything about human rights. Nobody said that they were voting for the opposition for reasons of democracy or any of the things that they're saying now. In fact, we only began to hear about these things, these talking points, in the hours after the polls closed. It wasn't on the menu. It wasn't part of the script. In fact, a lot of that campaigning that we've been hearing about human rights and democracy has been going on in the exterior. It's actually gone away in Venezuela. People have returned uh, to normal life in recent years. And it was only hours after the polls closed when all of the statements began being made and all of the tweets by the foreign leaders and all of those other people who are trying to intervene in Venezuela's uh, affairs that we began hearing some of that, those things again. Um, so, you know, I think it's very obvious that this is, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a completely artificially generated uh, scenario in which, just like in the case of Nicaragua and some of the other countries that we follow, in which there are reports being generated by the human rights industry based in Washington, based in Brussels or Europe, uh, making, making uh, declarations and assertions about the situation in Venezuela uh, that's not really based on, on truth. And it's really motivated, uh, has, has other motives. In this case, they're just trying to find any way to justify further intervening in the country in order to get the government out. So it was really those basic reasons that Roger cited that people were telling me all around those upscale neighborhoods, uh, such as Altamira and Chacao. And it's important to say, too, that people also said things that, uh, for example, they just want things to be more like the U.S. We hear that all across Latin America, that people just wish there were more things, uh, more American things. There's just some people who just want to have nicer malls, nicer uh, amusement parks. They want to, you know, have the things that they have when they go visit their relatives in Miami, in Miami, simply put.
Thank you. Justine, did you have anything you wanted to share? Sorry to put you on the spot, but. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, all I would really have to add to any of this, thank you for your points, Roger and Camilla. Um, that, that is basically what I had observed also. Um, there was only one encounter that I had with someone who was obviously pro Edmundo Gonzalez uh, that we had during the day of election observing. And she um, forced her way onto our bus and she was um, kind of just laying out uh, the context of who she was, which from what I could gather, she was a member of the petty bourgeois. She was talking about how she has all these degrees and how she uh, doesn't make enough money. And um, and then going on uh, bashing about um, social conditions of Venezuela, which um, I am not completely sure are are true, simply because I I, I didn't see it. Although that was my first time in Venezuela, <laughs> but uh, what I could gather was that um, she wanted to be have have a more capitalist system. She wanted to um, create more money um, with her degrees, the same way that people in the U.S. are able to. And um, eventually she was escorted off of the bus uh, by the police. And that was the only example that I saw of um, opposition. But I will say too, that in any opposition that I've observed uh, since the elections is that the one thing that is completely just like never mentioned is US sanctions. Like that is the reason why Venezuela is the is in the situation that it's in. The U.S. is never brought up in any of that, and there's just like sick contradictions going on when we're talking when they're talking about the people who fled Venezuela or whatever, and then when they get to the U.S., it are just 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 discarded like trash, you know, and they're the focus of the con of the material conditions of Venezuela and and why they are the way they are need to have a focus on US sanctions and US imperialism as a project for why that is yeah very very true point uh that's something that the daily reality of people in Venezuela is the impact of US sanctions this policy that was developed blatantly, openly, to say that the goal of it is to strangle the people of Venezuela, to make them follow the dictates of U.S. policy. And so when that's not mentioned in any media or out of the mouths of any opposition puppet, it is really uh, something we have to do, I think, as solidarity activists, definitely. So I think William has... Uh, joined us now uh, and has going to be able to share some remarks. Uh, William, do you want to go ahead and test your connection? Welcome. Uh, we'd really like to hear your remarks. I know one thing I was going to address since I'm back here in Venezuela uh, was just simply the media lies about how unstable Venezuela is, that there's a, close to a civil war, all of that. So if you want to share what Venezuela looks like to you right now, too, that's helpful. I am well, here. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and to see you guys. Um, yes, this has been very interesting time. Uh, well, there's a lot of noise out there about every, all kind of stuff, horrible stuff happening here. But reality, it's a huge uh, campaign. I know that you all know that it's a huge campaign against the Venezuelan government taking place right now. Um, the, the the beauty thing is that sometimes I, you know, you can really everything is normal. I don't see anything, nothing normal here. People are doing their daily life normally. Uh, also people, people are very um busy with their stuff, personal stuff. What I feel is very bad is that some people outside believe all the propaganda that is in the mainstream media. Certainly, uh, sanctions is a huge problem for Venezuela. Uh, certainly, the country will not be the same while we have those sanctions over Venezuela and over the Venezuelan people. But uh, right now, the life is, I think, that's normal. Yesterday, I went to several places to 
to see the you know people voting for the project and the communities and their uh, and the commune and it was very interesting to go to several communities. Uh, I went to um, um, El Valle and also to another area, Baruta, and 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 see several people in the commune voting for the project. And it's very interesting to see the enthusiastic of most of the people that were voting and for their own project, for their own communities. And, and, and honestly, people will have not been, I didn't see anyone worry about all this huge propaganda that the United States and the mainstream media has right now against the Venezuelan government. We need to be close to pay close attention to what's happening because we know that they will not stop. Uh, Maria Corina Machado has been saying that they will swear uh, in a mundo this coming January. And also the State Department has been very active Publishing all kinds of stuff again, the Venezuelan government. But tomorrow, we should be alert because tomorrow, the the all the uh, records of the electoral records will be published, and, and that is something very important. That's also happening in the period of time of the the legal period of time, and and we need to pay attention to, to what they can do next next uh, against the Venezuelan government. I feel that this is a huge campaign that will be until maybe January, February. But I feel that we need to be mobilizing, responding to every single attack to the Bolivarian revolution and trying to be alert. And uh, the art about it is yes, through these little things and these little phones, the lot of propaganda against the government here uh, people calling for uh, intervention, basically requesting the South Command to invade, uh, things like that. And it's, it's a very, it's a huge propaganda. Tomorrow we will have a huge demo here in the country um, uh, because uh, tomorrow 29, 28 is uh, one month of the victory. Uh, Maria Corina Machado was calling to, to protest against the government and so on. The Chavista will be outside too. And I feel that this will be taking place every single 28 until January. Um, so just to be alert, I just wanted to tell you that everything looked normal here. Don't, I don't see anything big. I, ha I have a blackout, but was for a few, maybe 30, 40 minutes. And I have another meeting, but a Zoom call to with the board of the Alliance for Global Justice. But I feel that everything here is, is I feel that despite the sanctions, despite the the war against the Venezuelan people, everything looked normal. I don't know, you want me to say something else, but I think that, yes, the big problem is the main campaign, the mainstream media campaign against the government. Thank you, William. No, that's great. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great response, and that's why we wanted to appeal to folks also to get involved in the Venezuela Solidarity Network so we can coordinate our response. There's lots of good links in the chat. Thanks, everyone, for sharing them. Uh, please encourage people to share everything that Justine's posting from the Red Nation about their report back, lots of good videos and analysis, including uh, from... Uh, many of the different webinars that have been happening, probably some folks on here have listened to multiple ones, but everyone's perspective is very different. And the changing dynamics of US intervention in Venezuela is also very different. If we remember in the days following the election, the US government strongly implied that they were going to recognize Edmundo Gonzalez as the president, as the person that won the most votes in the presidential election. And then three days later, during a State Department press conference, they said blatantly, oh, we didn't say that. We are not recognizing Edmundo Gonzalez. So there's some back and forth, and the people of Venezuela have continued to be mobilizing in the streets, as William described. It's really excellent uh, to 
and observe. And I, I hope to be able to participate tomorrow as well in the, um, the demonstrations in defense of Venezuela's sovereignty and independence in defense of their democratic election, which re-elected President Nicolas Maduro. There are though, um, as would be expected, many uh, questions in the chat uh, that I'm hoping uh, perhaps Roger, you could address. And they are about what we, uh, you know, in the Venezuela Solidarity Network, I think would agree and I would agree, we, we need to take a step back and really talk about US intervention in Venezuela and question why the New York Times is even so focused on the actas or the tallies in general, where did this narrative come from? But when it comes to these mainstream media outlets, they're directly reporting that the opposition has proof that they won. So what is your response to, what is this proof that has been presented and was the opposition able to present this proof, for example, to the Supreme Court of Justice? Yeah, that puts the, uh, that sort of exposes the opposition. So it's a, it's a good question. The opposition, and when we talk about the opposition, we should be clear that there is a broad opposition. I mean, the Chavista movement is a movement, a popular movement for poor and working people. So it's not a movement that supports that everybody, particularly middle class and upper class people don't support. Um, but the, the opposition itself is very broad. But the United States has deliberately supported the far right of the spectrum. So even if the United States was interested in unifying the opposition, they don't support the um, a unifying group. They, you, they, they support an extreme group. This extreme group does not recognize the legitimacy of the Venezuelan state, period. Neither does the United States. The United States is there for regime change. And so are these people. And that means that they are unwilling to engage in the institutions of the Venezuelan state. So in fact, the opposition, the far right opposition, has not um, gone to the Supreme Court and said, look, here's our proof. We'll show it to you that we won. In fact, the um, Edwin Gonzalez is in contempt of the Venezuelan Supreme Court precisely because they asked him for his proof and he refused to show it. Um, what we're seeing really is a media campaign. We're seeing an organization, um, a, a, a movement, a far right movement that's very strong in social media. It's very strong in Europe and the United States, but it doesn't really have a ground game or really a strong ground game. And that's the important thing to realize that the US media which are really just stenographers for the State Department, what they've done is they've shifted the narrative. They've shifted the narrative from what is the United States doing running a candidate in, in a foreign country's election? That should be what they're asking about. What is the United States doing give, um, sanctioning a country and holding a gun to their head? That's what they should be talking about. But instead, we're getting into all these things like actors and stuff like that, things that nobody has ever even heard of. Um, but they have gotten very, very obsessed about. Um, so I, I think for us position as solidarity activists, particularly the Venezuelan Solidarity Network, what we see is our responsibility is to uphold the right of Venezuela to have a sovereign country. Now, what they do internally, that's their business. But our business is really should be focused on what our government, the imperialist governments of the United States and Canada, are doing to prevent democracy in Venezuela. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'll, I'll just add briefly about the tallies uh, so that there is some... Uh, knowledge to share about that. Um, the tallies are coming out from voting machines. They're printed copies of the votes that were taken at each um, voting table. And all political parties that have a witness at the, uh, at the final uh, closing of the voting center and a uh, witness to when the tally or the acta is printed are able to have a copy. The opposition or the website uh, claims that they have certain copies that prove someone winning, uh, Edwin Gonzalez winning, and this has proved to have no basis in actual Venezuelan constitutional law. 
or in front of the Supreme Court because they refused to present them uh, at the Supreme Court. So without getting too far into the weeds, um, that is a, just kind of what those are in general. So thank you for that uh, question. And Roger, yes, I agree. Excellent response. I mean, I think that the point and the goal of building the Venezuela Solidarity Network is because we need to really focus and hone in on U.S. attacks on Venezuela and what that means to Venezuela's ability to deepen their democracy, uh, to continue their Bolivarian revolutionary process, and to understand that sanctions aren't just a word. You know, we talked about them earlier but in Venezuela, there's 930 sanctions leveled against the people of Venezuela that have impacts on food, medicine, healthcare, housing, everything. Venezuela's made a significant recovery. I once again learned on this trip about how productive uh, Venezuela has become and now produces nearly 100% of the food consumed in Venezuela, which is an incredible response to sanctions, which meant that there was trouble accessing food at certain points. But Venezuela lost 90% of its GDP when the U.S. imposed the heaviest oil sanctions. 40,000 people were killed, according to a study, between 2017 and 2018 because of these sanctions. And when people went to the polls, as we've already discussed, they voted knowing that if they voted for President Maduro, it could mean more sanctions. And it would, actually mean more sanctions, more difficulties, more attacks as we've seen. And that is an incredible thing to witness as an observer and to talk to people about why they continue to vote for President Nicolas Maduro and the Bolivarian revolutionary process. So we'll just take um, actually the time now, I think for wrap up. Uh, Camilla, I know there's lots of questions in the chat. And the excellent thing about having these questions is that, as I mentioned, the Venezuela Solidarity Network is going to continue these webinars and online pickets in solidarity with Venezuela. And we can answer these questions. We can continue to talk about them at future events or through future articles and open letters and everything that we're gonna work on together. So once again, I'll appeal to people here to join the Venezuela Solidarity Network. You can join as an individual or as an organization. You can find the links at uh, in the chat or at venezuelasolidaritynetwork.org. And it is an organization of folks in the United States and Canada. And so I encourage people in either of those two places uh, to join in. So we'll go ahead and do a wrap up. I'm sure uh, that uh, Roger and Justine have probably both been uh, reviewing the question. So if there's anything specific you'd want to address, feel free. We'll do our wrap up. And then for anyone that like, it's a, a tradition a, at the online pickets to invite folks to join us in the panelist space and turn on your cameras and we can do a group photo demanding US, Canada, hands off Venezuela and into sanctions and into intervention and to demand that the US recognize the results of the democratic election of July 28th. Justine, would you like to go first in your wrap up? Yeah, I can go first. Um, so uh, just, oh, am I okay? Sorry. Uh, just just closing out. Um, thank you for this time. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway uh, for the conditions of Venezuela is that U.S. imperialism is the big monster in the room. The U.S. has failed with its financials, with its production, and has reached a new stage of imperialism that is now being referred to as hyper-imperialism. The only card it has left to play is its uh, through its force. And the U.S. maintains hegemony through uh, its pure military force and, uh, and, and, and sanctioning the world. The U.S. has meddled in not in elections not only in Venezuela but countless other countries, and that is because they they are like using everything that they got to maintain escalation dominance and keep a chokehold on the entire world. And I, as an indigenous person and an indigenous socialist, feel that from within the belly of the beast when they uh you know and and Venezuela oil has everything to do with domestic oil and drilling on indigenous lands so um 
Again, I wish I could say more, but the best I can do is refer you to our podcast. Please listen to the Red Nation podcast. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And we have tons of analysis. Thank you so much for everything, everybody. Well, thank you, Justine. That was a terrific um, wrap up. It's hard to add to something to that. But I, well, let me just compare the recent elections in Venezuela to the recent elections in Ukraine. And you may ask, what recent elections in Ukraine? Well, it's the recent elections that didn't happen in Ukraine because President Zelensky's term in office is over. It was over in the spring. But hey, they didn't have any elections because why have elections? Because the second largest country um, party in, in, in Ukraine um, is banned. And it wouldn't make any sense to have elections anyway because all the opposition media is banned. But you don't hear anything about that. But you hear um, Venezuela being under the microscope. You don't hear anything about the recent elections in Peru, where the current president, Diana Bulate, um, um, is, and probably not doing that last name, the justice that needs, um, was never elected, but we never hear about that. So we need to shift the narrative, shift the narrative to focus on imperialism because that's our responsibility and let the Venezuelans figure out how they can make their own revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger Harris, Justine Taba. Camilla Escalante, who had to step away, which is understandable, and to William Kamakaro uh, for joining us today. It was really, I think, an excellent uh, report back on the Venezuelan presidential election and that uh, continued resistance of the people of Venezuela to US intervention and uh, really fighting back against this lie that Venezuela doesn't have a demo democratic process. I uh, think that uh, we are going to go ahead and move into the group photo part of the webinar. And uh, that is a time when, if you'd like, as a participant, you will receive a message that asks you if you would like to join as a panelist. And if you say yes, that means you'll be able to turn on your camera and uh, we can kind of do a group photo all together. As a wrap up, I'll also say to uh, really a big thank you to the interpreters for today. The webinar has been uh, done in both English and Spanish, which is uh, important when we are building a movement in solidarity with Venezuela and want to build as broad and uh, really welcoming movement as possible within the Venezuela Solidarity Network. So we remain committed to organize these events in English and Spanish. It really would not be possible uh, without Myra, of course, and Erica, who've been doing the interpretation. So thank you so much. For everyone that joined, uh, we apologize again for starting late today, a uh, half an hour late. And uh, it, you could help us out in uh, sharing the webinar around after it goes up on our YouTube, because uh, likely we did lose a few folks who uh, weren't able to join. Um, I hope some of you have been getting the, the link to join us as panelists. If you'd like to join the photo or just uh, see each other, it's a, a great way to wrap up the webinar. If you haven't received the panelist link, uh, you can raise your hand and you should uh, receive one. I'm just starting to see some folks joining in. So it's uh, great to see you. And I'm just scrolling through the chat to see if anything else. Lots of thanks for the interpreters. There are some questions uh, that I think we can definitely address in future webinars, questions about Venezuela, uh, specifically around indigenous issues, which I think would be really uh, excellent to learn about. Um, we're looking forward to hopefully having our next webinar in September, focusing on the struggle of Venezuelan women against U.S. intervention and sanctions and building the Bolivarian revolutionary process. And that's it. Big thank you to everyone for joining today.
Everyone's looking good. I'm trying. I uh, if Michelle or anyone would like to tell me if how our group photo is looking. I can't quite see it. Oh, I can see it better here. Okay, there we are. I think we still need a few more folks to join in. So if you've gotten the invitation to turn on your camera, please turn on your camera. It would be great to see you. There's a lot of um, questions still in the chat, I said, um, and uh, we couldn't get to it all, but uh, I really appreciate everyone's contributions and let's, there we go, there we go. We can say it all together. Hands off Venezuela. Hands, Hands off, off Venezuela. Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela. Hands, Hands off Venezuela. Oh, and William, you're still here. Sorry, I thought you had left. If you had any closing remarks. Viva Venezuela. My apologies. Viva Venezuela. <laughs> Viva Venezuela. Viva Venezuela. Viva Venezuela. Look forward to working with you all to build a more united and broader Venezuela solidarity movement in North America. Thank you to all the international observers, of which there were more than 900 and uh, international observers from over a hundred countries. Wish we, I were there, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, be talking to you all very soon. Uh, everyone have a good and safe night. End U.S. sanctions on Venezuela. End no to the blockade. Sanctions on Venezuela. End U.S. Really sanctions on Venezuela. And, uh, hands off. Hands off. Hands Yes, my dear. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.